Imagine being asked about a game-changing moment. You know, game-changing moments are something that are a matter of such a personal level that takes someone from one point in their life to the next point. And that next point may be what that next level is, whether that next level is a point in your performance ability as a career musician or just in your life and where that can go. But that game-changing moment really becomes so exciting to talk about. And I have had several in my life, and when I was asked uh, by Vic and the company to think about game-changing moments, I had to start reviewing my life. And being aware of the game-changing moment, I think, is the biggest quest that we must have, to be aware that we are all experiencing game-changing moments. When I was younger, I lived on Long Island, and uh, younger, I met some great teachers that were there, Al Miller, Charlie Perry, Ronnie Benedict, guys that were really dedicated players that worked with everyone from Xavier Cougar to Bob Hope to Benny Goodman. Great, great teachers that lived in the suburbs and of course worked in New York City. And what was amazing about it, when you met these people, they were so enthusiastic about drumming, that's what they did, they lived drumming. This is back in the 1960s and Al Miller was one gentleman that really had such an incredible dedication to teaching and of course performing. And uh, after five years of studying with him in 1971, he pulled me aside and said, Dom, you are one of my best students, I'm so honored to see your dedication and growth. I'd like you to come over to my house and meet a buddy friend of mine. A buddy friend. Come on by, we'll have a little dinner. I said, wow. I said, boy, Mr. Miller. He said, no, call me Al. So at that point, when you start to have your relationship change from your teacher that you look up to to now becoming a friend, that begins the beginning of that game-changing moment. So the next day, I said, boy, this is great, Mr. Miller. I want to come by, and Al. And I said, what can I bring? He said, boy, you know, bring some wine, and we'll have a little dinner. And so it was the next day. So as I'm driving to his house the next day, I passed by a club that was right around the corner of his house called Poor Peter's. As I'm riding by the club, I notice on the marquee it says, Tonight, the Buddy Rich Big Band. So I said, man, this is incredible. Buddy Rich Big Band is right around the corner from Al's house. I know he's mentioned Buddy's band a few times. We've kind of seen him, you know, when the band's been playing, he always says he goes to see him. So I'm going to go get some tickets. So I buy three tickets front row center. And of course, I put it in my pocket. I go to Al's house with my couple bottles of wine. I knock on the door, and Al answers the door, and I said, Al, have I got a surprise for you? He says, wonderful. Come on in. I got a surprise for you, too. So I walk in the house, and I turn to his living room in the suburbs of Plainview, Long Island, and there is Buddy Rich sitting on the couch. Buddy stands up. I walk in. I am now trying to lift my jaw from the ground because, of course, at that time in, in the early 70s, 1971, Buddy was already on the Johnny Carson show every few weeks and he was playing with Sinatra. It just didn't get any bigger than the star of what Buddy was about. So we get there and Al turns to Buddy and says, Buddy, this is that young student, Dom, I was talking about. And I'm shaking Buddy's hand. He says, Dom, this is Buddy, a dear friend of mine, and we're shaking hands. And I said to Al as I'm shaking Buddy's hand, I said, Al, you said I was going to meet a buddy friend of yours. This is not a buddy. This is the buddy while I'm shaking Buddy's hand. Well, Buddy loved that. We sit down, we have dinner, and uh, next thing you know, Buddy says, okay, guys, time to go to the gig. So I'm going, but the, the gig, the, the, the gig, we're eating. So, so Buddy goes, we'll take my car. At the time, Buddy had a little red Corvette Stingray. We go down in the car, and Buddy says, boy, Dom, you get in the back seat. Now, if you know a Corvette Stingray, there really isn't any back seat. Didn't matter, man. I climbed back in there, legs hanging out windows. I got in and squeezed in that car. Now I'm in Buddy's car. My teacher, who I look up to, is in the passenger seat, and Buddy Rich is driving the car. So it, it, it was like such a surreal kind of excitement. So we get there, we're driving. As we're driving a few blocks to the gig, I said, I said hey, guys, I, I, you know, I, got, I went and bought three tickets to the show because I didn't know I was meeting the buddy because you said a buddy, so I have no idea. So buddy starts laughing and says, you idiot, give me the tickets. You're going to sit backstage with Al. So I take the tickets out of my pocket, hand them up to buddy. Buddy pulls in front of the club. There's a line waiting to buy tickets. He gets out of the car. Everyone is shocked, walks to the last three people in line, gives them my tickets and say, I'll see you front row center. Gets back in his car, we drive around backstage. He puts two folding chairs on the side of the stage just by the curtain. And Buddy always set up with his band facing the audience, Buddy's drum sits with it to the right. So he put the chairs right there. He puts the two chairs down. We sit down. I am now looking at Buddy's drum kit from about a distance of less than three feet. 2,000 people were in the audience, most of them my friends who were going to go there and see Buddy perform. And I'm sitting there, Al's next to me, and Buddy says, guys, have a seat. I'll take you guys home after the show. And walks away to go get the band. So I turned to Al and I said, Al, 
this is like, why didn't you tell me the buddy, buddy? He said, well, if I told you it was buddy, you might have told some friends, and I try and keep this stuff personal because we have our time together. I said, how do you know him at this level? He said, well, we were in the Marines together in World War II. We were partners in the Marines. It just so happened that they both were from the New York area. They both happened to be drummers. They were both intense at drumming. And they became close friends at that point. And once I've learned that you're in any of the part of the armed services, specifically the Marines, that's it. You are brothers for life. So whenever Buddy came in town, he contacted Al. At that point on, whenever Al would get called by Buddy, he would call me up. So I had the chance of seeing Buddy well over 200 times. So game-changing moments happen at certain levels. The game-changing moment of me first taking lessons with Al, then the game-changing moment of me being invited by working hard as a student, as his better, best student, to go then and meet Buddy, and then go into the concert to see that. Now the game-changing moment of the concert, when you go to a Buddy Rich concert at those times, and I probably heard Buddy 200 times live, well, because he played in the East Coast area of New York a lot, was the fact that there are three different types of people that you meet backstage at a buddy show. There were all the great drummers in the world, so backstage, I met everyone from Max Roach to Louis Belson to Joe Morello to Jim Chapin to Steve Gadd to Carl Palmer to, you know, like all these incredible Elvin Jones, uh, Papa Joe Jones, Philly Joe Jones, uh, you know, Art Blakey, all these great, great drummers. Roy Haynes, it was incredible. They'd go back to meet Buddy, so once you're back there, you're kind of meeting them. So the fly on the wall that I was, and of course the, the kid that always just, you know, realized what my mom always said, you have two ears and one mouth, listen more than what you speak. So I did that. And what I heard was this camaraderie of great artists respecting each other and hugging each other and having this incredible bond. So that was another game-changing moment, not just being backstage, but seeing all these drummers hug and respect and learn from each other. If a practice pad came out, everyone was sharing their chops and ideas. It was incredible to see this enthusiasm of this drumming party. So to me, the journey has been this incredible, wonderful cycle of excitement that Every moment of your time, there's an opportunity and a game-changing moment that speaks to you. It's fate. The real powerful thing is fate talks to you every day. If you don't hear fate speaking, it's because you haven't learned how to listen. That's where the game-changing moments really have their most magic.